Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Rahul Potluri. I'm from uh, the United Kingdom, Birmingham in the United Kingdom. Many of you probably have not heard of the ACOM study unit, which I have founded in Birmingham. It's a four million patient clinical epidemiology unit that has done a significant amount of uh, outcomes-based research, uh, addressing the questions that are very valuable and important for us to know in real life, but we don't have clinical trials to answer these questions. So this study is looking at cardiogenic shock. My, I have no relevant financial dis relationships, but uh, the only disclosure I would like to make is that since I submitted the abstract, unfortunately we've had more data and actually the title doesn't fit the findings anymore. So I think we'll have to just call it cardiogenic shock and we'll see what it means. So as you know, a quick introduction to cardiogenic shock. Uh, cardiogenic shock is uh, globally defined as decreased cardiac output with uh, tissue hypoxia in the presence of adequate intravascular volume. The mechanism is inadequate oxygen delivery, uh, release of inflammatory mediators, and further microvascular changes causing changes to blood flow. And the clinical manifestations, as we all know, is hypertension and then eventually multi-organ failure. The clinical epi the epidemiology of cardiogenic shock, uh, surprisingly relatively few studies. Um, so most of the studies have addressed cardiogenic shock in the, pre in the context of uh, acute myocardial infarction or STEMI. And a recent study, I think in 2014, published in um, American Heart, uh, suggested 5 to 10 percent of STEMI patients had cardiogenic shock. And going back to 1999, the Worcester Heart Study showed that 7.5 percent of the heart attack patients had cardiogenic shock. Um, but there's very little more recent evidence, particularly in Europe, uh, in terms of how the trends of cardiogenic shock are evolving in view of the change management of acute coronary syndrome. Some studies have shown increase in trends. Um, the most important study with regards to cardiogenic shock is the shock registry, which I'll talk to you about a little bit in detail. Um, but the mortality rates remain very high in the region of 40 to 50 percent. So we wanted to evaluate the trends, mortality, and survival in patients with cardiogenic shock from a large data set in the United Kingdom. Um, and this is based in Birmingham at Aston Medical School. And this is a preliminary study because, as I mentioned, the abstract has changed in the last couple of months, and we're always adding more and more cases. So uh, by the time we're finished, we're hoping to get about 1,500 cases of cardiogenic shock. Um, so ACOM stands for Algorithm for Comorbidities, Associations, Length of Stay, and Mortality. Um, and it's a program that I have written um, uh, during my days as a medical student and evolved over the last 10 years. It can decode routinely available hospital admissions data into a research database. And this is particularly so relevant in the current environment of big data. But believe me, when we started about 10 years ago, nobody was taking us seriously. At the moment, we have 2 million patients. And by the end of 2016, we're hoping to increase that to 4 to 5 million. So with, in this particular study, we had 544 patients with cardiogenic shock, 55% male, mean age of 72.2 years, which is slightly higher than the shock registry. And the etiology of the cardiogenic shock here was 61% ischemic in the context of acute coronary syndrome, 31% was LV failure, 3% cardiomyopathy, and as others, as you can see. If you just look at this pie chart, this tells you how our results compare with the shock registry. As I mentioned previously, the shock registry was looking at cardiogenic shock in the context of acute coronary syndrome, whereas ours is looking at pretty much the entire cardiogenic shock spectrum. So they will be slightly different, but more or less you can see LV failure and ischemia contribute to the significant proportion of causes. And in terms of risk factors for the patients who've gone on to have cardiogenic shock, you've got the traditional cardiovascular risk factors such as type 2 diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol, ischemic heart disease, kidney disease. But surprisingly, these values are fairly low compared to the number of people who've had, compared to the risk factor profile in patients who have acute coronary syndrome. Uh, 
So this is a very busy slide. Uh, the reason I put it up is because I want to show you the trends of what ha has been happening. So as you can cl see clearly, the numbers of cardiogenic shock over the years have been decreasing. So from 278 to 73 in the last time period. So you look at that and you think clearly it's decreasing. But actually, the number of acute coronary syndrome during this period has more than half, has decreased in more than half. Um, so as a proportion to the number of patients who are coming into acute coronary syndrome, the figures are very similar, if not slightly higher. Uh, what is really interesting is the people who are now coming in seem to be much younger um, than people, say, 10, 15 years ago. Um, and the other interesting factor is that people with cardiovascular risk factors, type, such as type 2 diabetes and hypertension and high cholesterol, have significantly improved. These are all very important, and as I'll explain later. Uh, acute coronary syndrome as the cause for the cardiogenic shock is also uh, sort of slightly decreasing over this time period, as I mentioned. So if we look at mortality, this is crude mortality at 14 days, 30 days, and one year in these patients. Um, it, surprisingly, the mortality is going up in the last four years compared to the previous 10 years. Um, which was very surprising to me because the preliminary results, when I submitted the abstract, suggested that mortality was improving. So I had a clear story. Now it's not so clear anymore. So it, this, uh, the increase in mortality is in both groups, so in the general cardiogenic shock group and also in the cardiogenic shock with acute coronary syndrome group. Um, sorry about the Kaplan Maya. Basically, the third line was uh, yellow and you couldn't see anything, so I had to make some last minute changes. But you can see that the survival curves uh, for the 2010 to 2014 uh, show much worse survival in these cardiogenic shock patients compared to the previous years. Uh, this is 14 days, this is 30 days, and here you've got one year survival. So you can see something is really going on in the most recent cases. Now, I looked at how many of these patients with cardiogenic shock and have had the acute coronary syndrome have had revascularization over this time period. And surprisingly, the num proportion of patients who've had acute coronary syndrome and have had ca uh, cardiogenic shock, the revascularization has increased to around 40 to 45% in 2010 to 14, from 25% and then about 10% in 2000 to 2004. Um, and when we look at arrhythmias and cardiac arrest associated with patients with these um, over these time periods, we could see that the arrhythmias have significantly increased. The number of cardiac arrests as a proportion of the cardiogenic shock have significantly increased, uh, as with arrhythmias in the context of atrial fibrillation, ventricular tachycardia, and ventricular fibrillation have all increased. Uh, so I was thinking, does this mean that we're revascularizing people and that leads to worse outcomes? And I wasn't so sure, but then I looked at 30-day uh, you know, survival looking at the outcomes of these patients, plus and minus PCI. And what is clearly the case here is that PCI does improve survival. So that has confused me even more as to what, what exactly these results show. But I think I think having thought about it in more detail, I think what I could say is the number of patients clearly with cardiogenic shock are decreasing, and that's because the number of patients with acute coronary syndrome are decreasing because of better medical and also PCI uh, leading to reduced numbers of new uh, onset of acute coronary syndrome. But the patients who then do get acute coronary syndrome and have cardiogenic shock they are really ill patients, and mortality remains very high, if not increasing. Um, so as I said, this is a preliminary study, and we'll have another 1,000 to, well, we'll have a total of 1,000 to 1,500 patients in the near future by the end of 2016. And what would be really interesting would be to see it, it, what, what is the role of ECMO and balloon pump and other devices that are used in the setting of cardiogenic shock and how they would um, affect outcomes? And certainly that would be something that I'll be looking to do in this 1,500 patient sample. Uh, so quite a few interesting questions remain unanswered, but certainly fascinating whilst I was doing this work. Thank you. Any questions?